This presentation is for Chapter 17, Investments. In this presentation, we will describe the accounting for investments in debt and equity securities and the equity and consolidation methods of accounting. In the next presentation, we will evaluate other major issues related to investments in debt and equity securities and the information in the appendices for derivatives and fair value accounting. In the first learning objective, we will describe the accounting for investments in debt securities. There are many different types of debt securities that companies can invest in, as are shown on this slide. Some of these securities are issued by federal, state, and local governments, and others are issued by corporations. The accounting for investments in debt securities depends on the intention that management has regarding the length of time they expect to hold the securities. There are three categories of investments, held to maturity, trading, and available for sale. As this slide shows, there are two different methods of valuing the debt securities, amortized cost and fair value. The first category of investments held to maturity securities are valued at amortized cost. No unrealized gain or loss is recognized at year end. The second category trading is valued at fair value with any unrealized holding gains and losses at year end recognized in net income. And the third category available for sale is also valued at fair value, but any unrealized gains and losses at year end are recognized in other comprehensive income. The interest on all three investments, as well as the realized gains and losses when the securities are sold, are recognized in net income. We will cover each of the categories in more detail in the next slides. A debt security is classified as held to maturity if management has a positive intent and the ability to hold the security to maturity. When this is the case, the securities are accounted for at amortized cost and not fair value because fair values do not have any relevance to securities that are not going to be sold but will be held to maturity. Normally, companies will amortize any premium or discount on the investments in debt securities using the effective interest method unless the straight line method yields a similar result. It is very important that companies do not classify securities as held to maturity unless they really intend to keep them to maturity. If they sell securities from this portfolio before maturity, the whole portfolio of held to maturity securities could be tainted by the sale and considered as available for sale. To illustrate the accounting for held to maturity securities, we will consider Robinson Company that purchased $100,000 of 8% bonds of Bush Corporation on January 1, 2019 at a discount paying $92,278. The bonds mature on January 1st, 2024 and yield 10%. Interest is payable each July and January 1st. To record the investment, Robinson would debit debt investments for $92,278 and credit cash for the same amount. Companies do not usually record discount and premium accounts for investments as they do for their debt securities that they issue. This is the amortization schedule for the investment in the bonds. The first and second columns show the interest payment dates and the cash received of 4000 Note that the cash received will always be equal to face times the stated rate times six twelfths or one half. The third column shows the interest revenue. Interest revenue is equal to carrying value times market rate times six twelfths or one half. In the first row we see that the cash received was four thousand dollars which is equal to the face amount of one hundred thousand 
times the stated rate of 8% divided by 2. The interest revenue is equal to the carrying amount, $92,278, times the market rate of 10% divided by 2, or $4,614. The difference between the cash received and interest revenue is $614, which is added to the carrying amount of $92,278 to equal the new carrying amount of $92,892. This process would continue over the next five years until the entire discount of $7,722 is completely amortized, leaving just the maturity value of $100,000. To record receipt of the first interest payment on July 1, 2019, Robinson Company would debit cash for $4,000, debt investments for $614, and credit interest revenue for $4,614. Companies can sell held to maturity bonds slightly before the maturity date without tainting the investment portfolio. If Robinson sells the investment in the bonds on November 1, 2023 for 99 and three quarters plus accrued interest, they would amortize the discount on the bonds up to the date of the sale for $635, which is four six of the last amortization amount of $952. The entry would be a debit to debt investments for $635 and a credit to interest revenue for the same amount. This slide shows the calculation of the gain on the sale of the bonds. The selling price of the bonds was $99,750 or three quarters of the face amount of $100,000. The carrying value of the bonds at the date of the sale was $99,683 and the gain was $67. To record the entry, Robinson would debit cash for $102,417, credit interest revenue for $2,667, credit debt investments for $99,683, and credit gain on sale of investments for $67. The accrued interest of $2,667 is equal to the face amount of the bonds, $100,000, times the stated rate of 8%, times 4 divided by 12, for the four months since the last interest payment was made on July 1st. The next category that we will consider is available for sale securities. These are securities that the company does not intend to hold until maturity, but they don't necessarily expect to sell them in the near term. They are valued at fair value, but the unrealized gains and losses that are recognized at year end are credited to other comprehensive income until realized. The discount or premiums on these investments are amortized as normal, and it is the amortized cost that is compared to the fair value at year end. To illustrate the recording for a single available for sale security, we will consider Graph Corporation that purchases $100,000 of 10% five-year bonds on January 1, 2019, with interest payable on July and January 1st. The bonds sell for $108,111 and have an effective interest rate of 8%. Graph would record the purchase of the bonds by debiting debt investments for $108,111 and crediting cash for the same amount. This is the amortization table for the available for sale investment. The cash received each interest period is $5,000 equal to the face amount of $100,000 times the stated rate of 10% times 6 divided by 12 or 1 half. The interest revenue of $4,324 in the second column is equal to the carrying amount of the bonds $108,111 times the effective or market rate of 8% times 6 divided by 12 or 1 half. 
the difference in the cash of $5,000 and interest revenue of $4,324 is $676, which is subtracted from the previous carrying amount of $108,111 to arrive at the new carrying amount of $107,435. This process will continue for the next five years or until the bonds are sold. If held for the entire term, the premium of $8,111 would be completely amortized and only the maturity value of $100,000 remain. To record the receipt of the first interest payment on July 1st, graph with debit cash for $5,000 and credit debt investments for $676 and credit interest revenue for $4,324. At the end of the first year, the carrying amount of the bonds would be $106,732. Graph would compare this amount to the fair market value of $105,000 and make an adjusting entry. The entry would be a debit to unrealized holding gain or loss equity for $1,732 and a credit to fair value adjustment for the same amount. Most companies hold more than one available for sale debt investment in their portfolio. At the end of the year, the company will compare the fair value of the entire portfolio to the total amortized cost and make one adjusting entry for the portfolio. As shown, Web Company owns available for sale debt securities with amortized cost of $293,537 and fair value of 284000 for a difference of $9,537. To record the adjusting entry, Webb would debit unrealized holding gain or loss equity for $9,537 and credit fair value adjustment for the same amount. When a company sells bonds prior to maturity, they remove the debt at amortized cost and recognize any gain or loss on the sale in the other income section of the income statement. The unrealized holding gain or loss on the portfolio does not affect the recording of the realized gain when the security is sold. We will look at a sale of one of the available securities from the web portfolio in the next slide. Webb Corporation sold the Watson bonds on July 1, 2021 for $90,000 when the bonds had an amortized cost of $94,214. To record the entry, Webb would debit cash for $90,000, loss on sale of investments for $4,214, and credit debt investment for $94,214. At the end of the year, there is only one remaining security in Webb's portfolio, the Anacomp Corporation bonds with amortized cost of $200,000 and fair value of $195,000. The difference between the amortized cost of the bonds, $200,000, and the fair value, $195,000, is an unrealized holding loss of $5,000. To record the adjusting entry, Webb would debit fair value adjustment for $4,537 and credit unrealized holding gain or loss equity for the same amount. Trading debt securities are those investments that the company expects to sell in the short term. These securities are reported at fair value, but with any unrealized holding gains or losses reported as part of net income. The discount or premiums are amortized in any unrealized holding gain or loss recorded for the difference in the amortized cost and fair value at the reporting date. To illustrate trading securities, we will consider Western Publishing Company that had three debt investments in its trading securities portfolio as shown on the slide. The amortized cost of the portfolio was $314,450 and fair value was $318,200 with an unrealized holding gain of $3,750 at December 31st, 
20. To record the fair value adjusting entry, Western Publishing would debit fair value adjustment for $3,750 and credit unrealized holding gain or loss income for the same amount. This is the same entry made for available for sale securities except the adjustment is made to income rather than other comprehensive income because these securities are expected to be sold in the near term. In the second learning objective, we will describe the accounting for investments in equity securities. Investments in capital stock include the cost of the security as well as any broker's commissions and fees that are related to the purchase. The accounting for investments in equity securities is determined by the percentage of common stock owned by the purchaser, the investor, in the other company, the investee. This slide illustrates the classification of equity investments based on the ownership percentages in the investee. Investments of less than 20% of the investee's outstanding common stock are accounted for at fair value because the investor is considered to have only a passive interest in the investee. Investments over 20% but less than 50% are accounted for using the equity method of accounting because the investor is considered to have significant influence over the investee. Last, if the investor owns over 50% of the investee's common stock, then the investor is considered to have a controlling interest and the consolidation method of accounting is used. It is important to note that these percentages aren't the final determination of the proper accounting for equity investments. For example, it is possible that a company owning less than 50% of the common stock of the investee could have a controlling interest based on factors such as the exchange of management or other significant business relationships with the investee. Therefore, the FASB has issued stricter accounting guidelines for equity investments to prohibit accounting practices that are abusive, such as shifting debt to unconsolidated subsidiaries, one of the methods of achieving off-balance sheet financing that we discussed in Chapter 14. As we stated previously, holdings of less than 20% of the investee's outstanding common stock should be accounted for using the fair value method that we will illustrate in the next slides. However, some common stock shares that do not trade in the markets do not have readily determinable fair values. When there is no readily determinable fair value, the equity investment will continue to be valued at cost and adjusted for changes in observable prices minus any impairment. Any dividends received are recorded as income and gains and losses recognized when the securities are sold. This slide illustrates three equity securities in the portfolio of Republic Corporation with a total cost of $718,550. The investment in these companies are all less than 20% of the investee's common stock, which would require the use of the fair value method of accounting. To record the receipt of $4,200 in dividends from the investment in Campbell Soup Company, Republic would debit cash for $4,200 and credit dividend revenue for the same amount. At the end of 2020, Republic would determine the unrealized holding loss of $35,550 for the portfolio by comparing the fair value of $683,000 to the amortized cost of $718,000. $550. To record the adjusting entry, Republic would debit unrealized holding loss income for $35,550 and credit fair value adjustment for the same amount. On January 23, 2021, Republic sold the stock of Northwest Industries, Inc. for $287,220 for a gain of $27,520. The entry to record the sale would be a debit to cash for $287,220 and a credit to equity investments for $259,700 and gain on sale of investments for $27,520. 
on February 10th, 2021, Republic purchased 20,000 shares of Continental Trucking at a price of $12.75 per share, plus brokerage commissions of $1,850 for a total cost of $256,850. The portfolio at the end of 2021 had a total cost of $715,700 and a fair value of $779,950 for an overall gain on the portfolio of $64,250. Since the fair value account had a credit balance of $35,550 for 2020, the adjustment for 2021 would be an unrealized holding gain of $99,800. The entry to adjust the portfolio to fair value for 2021 would be a debit to fair value adjustment for $99,800 and a credit to unrealized holding gain or loss income for the same amount. In the third learning objective, we will explain the equity and consolidation methods of accounting. As we discussed previously, investments in the outstanding stock of the investee of at least 20% but less than 50% should lead to a presumption in the absence of other evidence that the investor can exercise significant influence over the investee. The investor can exercise significant influence by voting their shares, but also through business relationships which we discussed previously. Again, these percentages are only guidelines. A company might hold an investment greater than 20% but less than 50% and be unable to significantly influence the investee depending on the holdings of other investors. Original investments and investees accounted for using the equity method are recorded the same as those accounted for using the fair value method. However, the accounting after the initial recording is quite different. For instance, investors adjust the investment account for their percentage ownership in the investee's net income and losses, as well as the dividends received by the investor. The investment account is debited for the investor's percentage ownership in the investee's net income and credited for the investor's percentage ownership in the investee's net losses. If the investor's share of the investee's losses exceed the investment cost, then the equity method is ordinarily discontinued and no additional losses are recognized. When dividends are received from the investee, the investment account is credited. This slide illustrates the difference in the accounting for investments using the fair value and equity methods. On the left side, the fair value method is shown, and on the right side, the equity method. The differences in the equity method include the recording of the investor's percentage ownership in the investee's net income of $40,000 and losses $10,000 and dividends received of $20,000 directly to the investment account. Whereas using the fair value method, the investor records dividends received as dividend income and adjusts the fair value of the investment at the end of each of the reporting periods. When companies own more than 50% of the investee's outstanding common stock, there is a presumption that the investee, now called the subsidiary, is controlled by the investor, now called the parent. Investments in the subsidiary would be shown in the long-term investment section of the balance sheet during the year. At the end of the year, consolidated financial statements are prepared that include the net assets of the investee with the parent's net assets. Consolidation accounting is covered in advanced accounting classes. This is the end of the first part of the presentation on Chapter 17, Investments.